Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night study. Uh, tonight we wanted to go over or start going over what the early church fathers said about prophecy and end time events. So last week, or what we've been going through and, and looking at uh, what books are supposed to be in the canons, what books are mentioned in those canons, church fathers, Dead Sea Scrolls, things like that. And so we started talking about some of that stuff last week, just kind of set everything up. And this week I wanted to go through and just begin some of the basic ideas. So most of us know, um, at least it's tradition anyway, that we have uh, a first coming and a second coming. And right before the second coming, there's a seven year tribulation period. And at the beginning or right before or sometime before the seven year tribulation period, there's a um, uh, rapture. After the seven year tribulation period is the second coming. After the second coming is a millennial reign where Christ reigns for a thousand years. And that's kind of the basic stuff. Uh, but today we begin to hear people say, no, there's a pre or mid or post trib rapture. Or there's amillennialism, where there really isn't any second coming or any kind of millennial reign. Maybe there's a second coming, but there's no millennial reign. We're actually in the millennial reign now. Even though it's been more than, or almost 2,000 years, and the millennial reign is only supposed to be 1,000 years. They say, well, the numbers are symbolic, and it really just means something else. And we should always stop and ex explore those type of things, just to see if you've never heard of them before. It's wise to look into them. But why do we all believe the common interpretations? Well, I think I can show you from Scripture why. And I think I can show you from the Dead Sea Scrolls. But then another thing is the early church fathers. So if the early church fathers, specifically the ones that are disciples of the apostles, say this is what we were taught, one, two, three, four, five, and they all believe in a future 1,000 year reign of Christ that begins at a second coming. The second coming is preceded by a seven year tribulation period and a rapture. And they begin to tell you what they were taught by the apostles. That's fairly significant. Now, you can always say, well, somebody edited the text later, and that's always a possibility. And of course, the people that would edit these things would be the people in the Middle Ages. And the people in the Middle Ages would be uh, Roman Catholic, basically. And so if the church fathers were edited, you know, doctored up by the Roman Catholics, they would be very pro-Roman Catholic in every way. So we see that the church fathers are still premillennial. Um, and when we get into it, the things that begin to be Roman Catholic doctrine, they are very much against. So there's no way that the the Catholic or the medieval church or the Orthodox church has tampered with them. Somebody else may have mistranslated parts of them. So we always got to be careful of that. But I want to take some time today and show you uh, some of the church fathers and go from there. So just like we, you know, if you had a question about something, the perfect thing would be to walk up to Jesus and ask him, I have this question, what's the answer? And I'm sure he would tell you. Well, since Jesus is not here and everything that he talked about and said is written in the four Gospels, the next best thing would be to walk up to John and say, well, you knew him. Did you ever ask him about this? Yeah. What did he say? Now, that's secondhand information, but still from an apostle. And that's what we have in the New Testament. There's really no extra writings uh, per se from the apostles themselves outside of the New Testament. That's what the New Testament pretty much is, their writings put together. So they're pretty much self-explanatory, but there's still pieces. There will always be pieces that you would ask, did you mean this or that? So the next best thing on that would be to ask somebody who knew John or someone face to face. Did you talk to them about it? Yes. What did they say? They told me that they meant this. And they could be lying, of course. Uh could be mistranslated. So the only thing we can take for sure is the Old and the New Testaments, but we want to look at everything else. So let's look at this real quick. Let me give you kind of an introduction of the people we're talking about. 
This is a book we wrote a ways back called The End Times by the Ancient Church Fathers. We had several years ago put together a book called The Ancient Church Fathers. And just a real brief synopsis, what did they teach about prophecy, salvation, uh, did the gifts of the Spirit ever cease, for instance, uh, um, just different things, the scriptures, what's, you know, all sorts of different things like that, uh, heretics, just different things. So what we did uh, several years later is like, okay, let's go back and pull a few little things out of there. What, what did they teach about the rapture, for instance? But take that out and pull and create a book, Just Prophecy, by the ancient church fathers. And so that's basically what we did here and back in 2016. So let me, what we're going to do is we have an introduction. And then we talk about some of the basic uh, prophecies that they say. And so we'll look at the first century, uh, just a handful of quotes. That's really what we're going to look at today. And then there's Justin Martyr, probably those two together. Justin Martyr is a little further in the, into the second century. And then there's Irenaeus, who has a lot of teachings. And then there's uh, Ephraim, the Syrian. Now, he's further up, but he wrote a book called The End Times. And we'll talk about that later, of which he talks about a whole lot of stuff. And then there's Hippolytus, who wrote a book called The Antichrist, as you can see here. And it's got quite a bit of stuff in there. Same interpretation that we would do of Daniel and Revelation. It's just nice to see these people saying, I asked the apostles, and they told me this. And so that's where we get our traditions from. And then occasionally they'll say, he told me this means this. And we're like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm lost. What, what, you know, how did you get that? So it should be interesting. And then he also wrote one called On the End of the World. So one on the Antichrist, one on the end of the world. And those, the Old Testament, or not, no, the Old church fathers the the books that they would write are not like three or four hundred page books like we would today they're more like 30 page books so they're small so that's kind of what we did and it, we we did those three books in their entirety in this book the one by ephraim and the two by hippolytus but we started out at the beginning just looking at the other things so let's go through i'm going to skip the introduction i want to show you this let me run this down here and kind of, yay, there we go. This is a chart we put in it. So just to give you a little bit of background, you probably all know Peter, Paul, John, Mark, and Mark, those four. Those are four of the major um, writers of the New Testament apostles. So here's this guy first. We can see this. It's Clement of Rome. And Clement of Rome is uh, an interesting character. He lived in Rome, obviously. Uh, he had a business there. He first heard the gospel from Barnabas. And he mentions all this in his memoirs, how he got saved. And then he eventually decided uh, no sense in throwing stuff away. So he's going to, Barnabas went back and he took a couple of years to sell his business that he inherited from his father for a good amount, you know, and get everything all ready. And then he migrated or moved from Rome to Jerusalem, where he studied under Peter mainly. Uh, but we've got Peter, Paul, and John are the ones that he would say are his mentors. And he wrote his memoirs about all that. Really interesting guy. And a couple of other books, too. So we have that. We have Tertullian and Cyprian in, in the area of what they're doing. But we don't know who they were um, disciples of. So we'll leave them alone for now. And this is, you can see, 100 A.D., 200 A.D., and 250. So kind of showing you this. Now, John is the one we want to look at. So according to the early church fathers, John apparently was in this scene, um, used his herbal medicine, had a very long life. They normally lived to be 110 to 120. And that fits for what we know. Because John was a, a disciple of Jesus. So he would have been at least, say, 20-ish. Um, when Jesus was, when you know, in, during the ministry, so 25 to 30, somewhere in there. But he continues to, to teach, and basically what happens is he, uh, Paul, um, ha has Timothy and Titus as disciples. 
And Timothy, of course, goes to Ephesus. He becomes the first bishop or pastor at Ephesus. Well, John, later on in life, goes to Ephesus and uses that as a headquarters. It'd be like if I came to your church, you're the pastor, you run your church, and maybe I'm an apostle way above you, but I don't mess with that. You do your thing. I'm just hanging out at the church, using it as a missionary outreach. So John will take off and go somewhere and plant a church, and it might take a couple of months, it might take a couple of years, whatever. He gets it organized, puts somebody in there as pastor, makes sure it's working right, comes back to Ephesus, takes some time off to recuperate, maybe a few months or a year to relax, whatever. And then he does the same thing again. So he's, he's going out planning all these churches. Well, he does this, and that's why we get the seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation, Smyrna and all those. So what he's doing at a certain point, he's arrested for being a Christian, and this is 95 A.D., so in 95 AD, he's sentenced to the Isle of Patmos for the rest of his life. And God put him on a timeout is what happens. He writes the book of Revelation. And then he um, gets released from prison. He goes back to Ephesus and begins to continue that uh, missionary planning. And he, he lives for another 20 some years. He died and is buried in Ephesus. Timothy eventually dies and is buried in Ephesus. Mary, Jesus' mom, was with him, of course, died, buried in Ephesus. Um, I, un I understand the Catholic dogma is that Mary never died, but it's not what the church father said. Anyway, um, so that's what's going on. So to back up, this guy here, Polycarp, Polycarp is a disciple of John, and not only a disciple of his, but also worked with him in ministry, planting those churches for at least 20 or more years before the Isle of Patmos incident and decided to, you know, and continued the work. Uh, he was never arrested at that point, but he continues the work. And John, of course, comes back a year later and they get back together and they work for at least another 20 some odd years. And it says that John the Apostle died during the reign of Trajan. So it's somewhere between 100 and 118. And most of them put it somewhere around 115 is when John died. Polycarp continues for quite a long time after John's death and eventually is martyred somewhere in the 150s, like 156. Uh, so apparently he was very uh, healthy also. Now, this guy underneath it, Ignatius, he's an interesting character. He was another disciple of John. Both Polycarp and Ignatius knew each other, worked together occasionally. Ignatius ends up being martyred about 90 A.D., so if you think about it, Ignatius is martyred about the time or sometime before John writes the book of Revelation. And Ignatius wrote at least seven epistles to churches talking about basic Christian doctrine. So even though he's not an apostle, he is a disciple of the apostles that works with the apostles and actually wrote everything that he did and then was martyred before John wrote the book of Revelation. John's disciple. So what Ignatius says, we probably would want to, you know, pay attention to. Incidentally, it's interesting. He's got books that he wrote in the, like around 70 AD talking about the Trinity, you know, divinity of Christ. Of course, we've seen that from the Dead Sea Scrolls too. So again, not much of a surprise there, but it's interesting. So now Polycarp has two main disciples, Justin Martyr and Irenaeus. Justin Martyr, you've probably heard of. He was eventually martyred. That's why he's, that's actually not his last name. But, uh, and then Irenaeus is a good disciple. Irenaeus actually writes a book called Against Heresies. It's against all the cults in his day. Very fascinating five volume work. And so then Irenaeus has two main disciples, Hippolytus and Caius. And Hippolytus, uh, about 40 some odd years later, writes his own five volume book, uh, Refutation of All Heresies. So a little bit different set of cults that he writes against. Caius, we think, is the guy that wrote the Materionian Canon Fragment, which we talked about when we were studying the canons. So Mark, of course, uh, one of the disciples, John Mark, where it writes Mark, he goes to Alexandria, Egypt, plants a church. Uh, we're not sure who succeeds him. One or two generations down is this guy named Pentheus. 
and then he uh, runs a school, and then he eventually turns the school over to Clement of Alexandria. So you probably heard of him, and then eventually there's Origen and other guys. Very interesting, mysterious story with Pantheus, but we'll we'll come back to that some other day. And then Paul has a disciple called Methides. Uh, may or may not be a direct disciple of Paul, but studied with Paul and some of the others. So this will give you an idea in the first hundred years, um, 150 years, whatever. So we want to look at mainly John. I've always looked at these guys, Polycarp, Ignatius, Irenaeus, and Hippolytus are the ones that write the most, and explain a lot to us, but also know of these guys. Now there's another guy back in here I don't have on the list called Papias or Papias, whatever. Uh, not Papaya, Papias or Papaya. So anyway, he studies directly under the apostles also. So for people that have seen the apostles face to face, you've got Papias, you've got Methetes, um, Ignatius, Polycarp, Clement, and then maybe these guys here, and that's about it. But that's enough to start off with things. So let me go ahead and run this back the way we had it. And we will go down and get started here. So that's a little bit of information on the guys. So with that in mind, we're going to go to the first thing, which is this concept of 6,000 years. And we see it in the Dead Sea Scroll calendar very clearly. And I've known about it from the church fathers for a while. The idea that Jesus was supposed to come around at least the year 4,000. And the second coming should be around at least the year 6,000. And many of us talk about, well, we have no clue when anything like that would happen. Well, most prophecies don't have a date with them. Like they say, could you set a date for the rapture? No, I couldn't. Can I set a date on when Damascus is destroyed or when uh, Iran is finally destroyed with the stuff that's probably going to happen in the very near future? No, there's no date about it. There's a lot of, a lot of information on who does it, how it happens and what happens, but there's no dates. Other times though, like in Daniel chapter nine, you've got an event so many days later, Messiah's cut off. So you know exactly when that's gonna happen. So some things are dated, most things are not. And so we wanna go forward. So we're not supposed to even try to set a date for a rapture, which makes sense because it's just some time before the tribulation period. Five minutes, five years, 50, uh, you know, we don't know. So, but this is the concept then. Jesus is supposed to come around the year 4,000. On the Essene calendar, the year 4,000 would have been the change of the age. So that would have been 75 AD. So Jesus was born about 70 some years before, uh, grew up, of course, and then his ministry was uh, basically 30 to 33 AD and he dies. And then that same year, the church is born. So the church is born for about 40 some years before the end of the age. And you see a lot of things happening before, during, and after the changes of ages. And so we're just getting up to it. Now, according to the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, uh, the last Jubilee, which is the last 50 years of this age, begins in 2025, which is a reason why I don't, you know, and I could be totally wrong, but I don't see uh, the rapture happening, or definitely not the tribulation or the second coming because those are all, you know, and no millennial reign starting in 25. Um, uh, rapture could, I suppose. Um, but we'll see. I mean, the, that's just based on the calendar. So here's what the church fathers are saying about some of those same things. A millennial reign, tribulation period, uh, antichrist, things like that. What did they believe about that? So the first thing is the 6,000 year thing. So many of them quoted it or was taught this. So let's look at this. This is the introduction I just gave to you. But here's Barnabas. Remember, Barnabas was a companion of Paul. Barnabas wrote an epistle, and we've got that translated, um, and it's pretty interesting, too. Uh, it's got a little bit of prophecy in it. It's mainly about typological prophecy and those kind of things. So it's got some interesting things. But in chapter 15, he says this. Therefore, children, in six days... He's talking about the, um, what, what the, um, 
creation week represents. So God could have went like that and everything would have been created. So why did he do something on one day, something on another? Why did he take six days to create everything? Uh, most of us just say, that's what he did, you know, don't give it a second thought. But the ancient ones, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls and other stuff talk about the fact that it means there will be 6,000 years of man's history creating and doing things. And then a thousand year day of rest, a millennial reign. And we see the millennial reign taught in, in the book of, um, well, actually several places throughout the Old Testament, but clearest in chapter 20 of Revelation. So he's talking about this. So you're going to see this come up quite often. The seven day week pattern teaches us that there will be 6,000 years of human history and a millennial reign. Okay. And uh, it would be really neat to look and see if there was some so, sort of ancient ritual, you know, like a Passover Seder, something that they did on Sabbath. I'm sure there was. Um, don't know if it's been garbled or if we have it or anything like that, but it might, anything like that might give us more information. So this is what he says. Therefore, children, in six days or 6,000 years, all the prophecies will be fulfilled all the way up to the millennial reign, coming to Christ. When it says, quote, he rested on the seventh day, we're talking about Genesis creation week. This signifies at the second coming of our Lord Jesus, he will destroy the Antichrist, judge the ungodly, change the sun, moon, and stars. I don't know if that's calendar or what he's talking about there. Then he will truly rest during the millennial reign which is the seventh day. So we could speculate on a few other things here, but he's clearly teaching if you had an accurate calendar and assuming that the calendar is correct, um, the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, uh, then we would know when the year 6,000 is. So somewhere around there, uh, except if the days are shortened, you know, as, as Revelation says, but somewhere in there, we should have a um, second coming. So, and every day that we go by and it doesn't happen, we're getting closer and closer to that date. So this is Barnabas. You could say, okay, well, Barnabas had this weird idea. Nobody else seems to just forget about it. Well, not just him. So again, well, let's hop, hop over to, again, Irenaeus, the guy we mentioned. So John Tart teaches Polycarp and Ignatius. Polycarp teaches Irenaeus. Irenaeus mentions that he occasionally got to see John the Apostle. So pretty interesting there. Irenaeus in his Against Heresies, five-volume work against the cults, he says, the day of the Lord is a thousand years. That's a quote from the Psalms and Peter, you know. And he goes on and says, in six days, he created uh, all things or all things were completed. It is evident, therefore, they will come to an end in the sixth thousandth year. So if we start from the creation of Adam, creation week, and you go forward 6,000 years, that should be the beginning of a millennial reign. So Barnabas, Irenaeus, both te teach that. Now here's Hippolytus. Remember Hippolytus or Hippolytus, however you want to call it. Um, he probably will tell us when we get to heaven. Neither one of those is how you pronounce my name. Anyway, uh, he says, and, and of course, in the book, of course, we got the dates of approximately when they might be written sometime at that point or before. But he says the Sabbath is a type of future kingdom. And we see this in Paul uh, in Hebrews uh, chapter four, talking about there is a real Sabbath, a real rest, uh, which is a type of Sabbath or what the Sabbath typifies. Anyway, he goes on and says the Sabbath is a type of future kingdom. For a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So it's that same quote, the same teaching. Since then, in six days, the Lord created all things. It follows that in the six thousand years, it will all be fulfilled. Okay. Now you go up a little further. Here's Commodius writing against uh, the gods of the heathens. He's, it's an anti-cult type thing. An apologetic actually anyway he says 
against gods of the heathen 35 he makes this comment we will be immortal when the six thousand years are completed now of course in a sense we're already immortal but i don't have a glorified body and when i die i'm out of this body but i still don't have my glorified body yet and he's talking about immortal in that sense in the resurrection so later on down in, in chapter 80 of that same book he says resurrection of the body will be when the six thousand years are completed after the 1,000 years, that'd be the millennial reign, the world will come to an end. Now, again, we're not talking so much about the rapture or the seven-day period or how that all works. We're just talking about first coming around 4,000, second coming around 6,000. So he goes on later, uh, and a lot of them do this, will explain things. So nothing about the rapture, nothing about a tribulation period. We're just setting the stage for the fact that there's a millennial reign that's yet future. Okay. Now, Victorious, uh, AD 240, this is his commentary on the book of Revelation. So it's the oldest commentary on the book of Revelation that we have. So he says this in one particular place, Satan will be bound until the thousand years are finished. After this, that's after the sixth day. And it says nothing like that in Revelation. This is his commentary. So when Satan's bound, remember in Revelation, it says he's bound at the beginning of the millennial reign. And he's bound throughout the millennium until he's loosed at a, some point toward the end of it. So he's saying that at the end of the 6,000 years is the end of the sixth day. And that's when the millennial reign would be, when Satan will be bound. So just a, just a quick comment, but apparently believing the same doctrine. Here's Methodius from 290. He says, uh, 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 in a, a book he wrote about the 10 virgins. So it's about prophecy, about the, remember the 10 virgin uh, parable or prophecy that's in Matthew uh, 24 and 25. So he says, in the seventh millennium, so that's between the year 6,000 and 7,000 during the millennial reign. In the seventh millennium, we will be immortal, right? We'll have our glorified bodies and truly celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. So it's, it's an interesting quote there. And then this last one, I never went past three, 350 because I figured if you got a handful of guys all teaching the same thing, past 350 it's they're either going to be saying the same thing again or something different which probably means they've twisted something so just mainly staying with the first mainly the first couple hundred years but we get up to 300 so this is uh lactanus really interesting guy uh divine institutes chap book seven or chapter seven and he says the six thousandth year is not yet complete when its number is complete, the consummation must take place. And the consummation is like the fulfilling of all prophecy. We see this in, uh, I'm trying to think where that's at. When Jesus was taken to be circumcised and Simeon was there and he, the Holy Spirit told him that he would see the Lord's Christ or the Lord's Messiah. And in that chapter, it mentions there's a, a priest, not priestess, a prophetess named Anna, who was constantly in the temple teaching on the redemption of Israel, which is prophecy. And he uh, was retired, basically. He's a whole, but he, he was in the temple most of the time talking about and studying and telling people about the consummation of, of everything. So these were two people that were prophecy experts. They were apparently a scene in doctrine. So he uses the same concept. So the prophecies are fulfilled. So this is just a few quotes to let you kind of see this. So our first point is, um, and I don't want to say the vast majority, but say like there's, um, you know, a hundred different church fathers in the first 300 years. Out of those hundred church fathers and maybe the five or six books that they may wrote, tons and tons of writing, most of them are not going to talk about prophecy. There's a lot of other more important things like the cults of their day and things like that. 
So if you dwindle it down to the people that talk about prophecy, it might be 10, 20%. And out of the prophecy, a lot of people are going to talk about when the Lord comes back. We got to be ready when the Lord comes back and then go back into the morality part. So they won't talk a lot about it, but then they'll mention Daniel or Revelation, some of the basic ideas of, of the second coming. And sometimes they'll, out of all that, very few even mention a rapture. And most of the people that mention a rapture, for instance, are going to say, there's a rapture. Well, we're looking forward to it. And they don't even begin to try to tell you either a date or it's pre or before, or, you know, any kind of connection with anything. And then out of those that do, a very small percentage will actually begin to explain to you when it is, or not exactly when, like a date, but that it's pre-trib. So, and we'll study that later. So interesting. So these guys could be wrong. Um, I could be wrong. I look at the scriptures and try to figure them out, and I think I'm pretty level-headed. But I don't have anybody to go to and say, hey, John, Peter, come here. I'm thinking this means this. What do you think? And for them to say, Ken, you're a nut. That's not what it means. Or, yeah, that's what we've always taught. So it'd be nice to have them here to say that. So that's our first point. And I want to go through just a few more little things, and then we'll stop for tonight. But I want you to remember, first off, these guys are, we start off with the people that are disciples of the apostles and move forward. And they all teach the same things. Okay. So second, we're going we're gonna to look at the first century Christians. And there's very little of, of them that are on prophecy. Okay. So first, there's a fragment of Papias, fragment six. He, we don't have anything that's a whole anything of his. But in fragment set, this is interesting. Look very careful at what it says. I was taught by the apostle John himself. Okay, so my mentor, it's not Chuck Smith, it's not, you know, Billy Graham, or it's not that I was taught by the Apostle John himself. Okay, that, well, what did the Apostle John teach you? That after the resurrection of the dead, Jesus will reign, or will personally rather reign for 1,000 years. So according to him, there is no amillennialism. There is no postmillennialism. We're all premillennial. And you'll find that all of the church fathers, if they mention prophecy at all, again, they all taught premillennialism. And I think that's pretty, pretty much recognized by all denominations. The people that teach amillennialism will think, yeah, they just were confused. And they could get confused, but when you could go back and ask Peter and Paul and John, am I confused? And to be told by John, no, that's what I've always taught. Unless this is garbled or he's lying, uh, which I suppose is a possibility, this is pretty significant. Now, again, most of us believe in a premillennial, you know, reign of Christ. I mean, that we're premillennial anyway, but it's interesting to have that. So here is another quote from the Epistle of Barnabas. And this is what he says. There's a couple of interesting things in here I'm going to pull out. But again, the basic idea is premillennialism. So the Epistle of Barnabas, chapter 16, and this should be the companion of Paul, Barnabas. He says, you can perceive that their hope is vain. In other words, we're talking about the Jews. The temple has been destroyed probably, and there's the wars going on, and they think they're going to attack Rome and win. Well, they're vain. I mean, it's not going to work. Now, if God was on their side, it would work. But the prophecies in the scripture says the opposite. They, they lose the war with Rome at the second coming because of the apostasy and rejecting Messiah. And then they come back later and, you know, other stuff. So he's, he's talking about this situation. They're going to rise up now and attack Rome, but it's going to be vain because we know what the prophecies say. You can perceive that their hope is vain. Furthermore, the Lord said, Behold, they who destroy this temple, even they will build it again or build it up once more. Now, that's an interesting quote. I don't know where that's at. 
It may be something he heard of that that the Lord had said, um, unless it's just, you know, through the translation Greek and Latin, maybe into English or whatever. Um, so anyway, but he's saying this is a prophecy. They that destroy this temple, even they will build it up once more. So he's talking about the idea that the Jews destroying the temple of the Lord, which is actually Jesus' body, probably is what he's getting at. And that they will come and build it once more. So, and he goes on to explain this. He said, this prophecy was fulfilled because the Jews went to war against their enemy. So if they would have simply said, okay, whatever, we're going to submit to Roman law until we can ask you to leave and you leave, there would have been no destruction of the temple. There's no reason to destroy a large complex like that unless rebels are hiding out in it. So it's because of the zealots and the Sakari that the temple was destroyed in a sense. So the prophecy was fulfilled because the Jews went to war against their enemy. But even though they are now no more than servants of Rome, and there's no way they could attack Rome and win at this point, still, they will return and rebuild the temple. It was revealed, and this is basically him quoting uh, like Malachi, it is revealed that the city of Jerusalem and the temple and the people of Israel were to be given up. Actually, I said Malachi. I think that's Micah, Micah 5, talking about those things. And there's several other prophecies too. So he's saying the prophecies are specific. They reject the Messiah. They come against Rome. Rome destroys the temple and eg uh, exiles Israel. That's, been, that's prophesied. The exile of Israel, the second one under Rome, is actually prophesied in Deuteronomy and several other places. And it actually took place. But sometime in the future, whenever that is, and he doesn't say, they will come back to Israel and reconstitute Israel, the, the, the nation. That happened in 1948. Then they will take back the Temple Mount. That happened in 67. And those are specific prophecies he's not talking about, but those were dated. Very few of the prophecies have dates on them, but that, those are two of the more interesting ones. Anyway, so sometime after 1967, they're going to rebuild a temple. They want to, they have plans for it. Nothing's moving forward because it's not politically feasible right now. But we know it happens because sometime in the future, there's a seven year tribulation and an Antichrist who, in the middle of that seven year period, sets in a rebuilt temple and stops sacrifices that apparently had been restarted. You got to have a temple to, to restart the sacrifices. So it's all coming. As a matter of fact, the way that it always works is that there are practice sacrifices before the temple is actually dedicated. Practice sacrifices started in 2016. So a lot of people don't realize that. So anyway, but so this is Barnabas. So pulling all this together, Papias and Barnabas both say that there's going to be a literal future 1,000 year reign of Christ. Okay. And the epistle of Barnabas is basically saying that the Jews are destroyed, pushed out, cease to exist. But one day they come back and they rebuild the temple. There's actually an interesting quote from, I think it's Irenaeus. He was asked whether or not, you know, the Jews will come back and everybody's like, yeah, that'll never happen, that kind of stuff. And Irenaeus is kind of interesting. He just says, well, the prophecy says the temple gets rebuilt. And as a Christian, we're certainly not going to do it. Hmm. That's all he said. So it's it's an interesting thing. He didn't want to get into a debate. But if we know it's going to be rebuilt, Christians aren't going to do it. Buddhists aren't going to do it. Who would do it? Jews. Well, that means they come back and they do it somehow, sometime. We're seeing that. So that is pretty interesting. So let's look at Justin Martyr, and then we'll stop. We'll look at um, uh, Irenaeus next week and kind of go forward with it. But here's Justin Martyr, just a few things about prophecy. Again, uh, John has two disciples, which is Ignatius and Polycarp. Polycarp has two disciples, Justin Martyr and Irenaeus. 
So these guys are getting into actually doing books and large segments of, of books on prophecy. And maybe Papias and the other guys did too, but they're just not existent. So just three quotes. And Justin Martyr in his dialogue, uh, chapter 32, says this. The man of sin spoken of by Daniel. So this is the prophecy about the Antichrist in Daniel, probably in in uh, chapter 11 or so. Will rule. Now, this is interesting. Notice this. It actually says will rule two times. You know, it's a time, time and a half. So he's talking about the two times, the times but he doesn't get the half a one in there or it's been cut out or, you know, it's slipped off the page or something. Now in other places, he talks about it and says time, time and a half. So he's quoting it right. So this, it's, this is a great example of how you don't look too close to these things. So if he says in two or three places, it's a time, time and a half, it's exactly what our Bible says. And then in one spot, he says times. Well, where's the time and a half part? Well, it's, you know, whatever. It's somehow not there for whatever reason. It's a uh, scribal error. It's not a big deal. There's one place where, um, uh, and you may have heard this, and the, the name of the Antichrist equals 666. There's one really ancient manuscript that says 616. And everybody always questions that, like, hmm, is it 666 or is it 616? Well, Irenaeus actually mentions that manuscript, and he tells you it's a it's a scribal error. He knows the guy that messed up. He knows the document, and it's just a scribal error. We all know it. Before, during, and after, it always says 666. He learned this from Polycarp, probably double-checked it with John himself. So it's not a big deal. But that's that's the value of the church fathers. You'll have those kind of things. So, and, and that's why we need to pull them all together. So he says it's supposed to be three times, a time, time and a half. So anyway, but the man spoken by Daniel the prophet will rule time, time and a half before the second advent. So we know that the first half of the tribulation period, that seven year period, the Antichrist does a bunch of wars and he's coming to power. In the middle, he finally takes his full power. So from the middle of the tribulation to the end, that three and a half years, as it says in Daniel, he is a complete ruler. So Justin Martyr's interpreting it the same way. So, so far, Justin Martyr says that there is a, to believe this, you have to have, you have to be premillennial and believe right before the millennial reign, there's a seven year period and it's divided into two sets of three and a half and there's an antichrist and he's going to rule completely for the last three and a half years of that seven year period. So that's basically, we're seeing this. So that's the basic doctrine that we've all been taught and believed. So here's Justin Martyr, just a little bit later in, in Dialogue chapter 81. He says, there will be a literal 1000 year reign of Christ. Okay, so there you go. He's premillennial too. Sometime in the future, now that's back in his day, of course, in 150 AD, but sometime in the future, there's going to be a thousand year millennial reign and it hasn't happened yet. And we're not in it now because it's symbolic of something else. It's literally future. And right before that is a seven year tribulation, Antichrist and that kind of stuff. So here's the last quote, Dialogue 110. He comes up to the subject again and he says, the man of apostasy, that would be, you know, Paul quotes, uh, refers to him as the man of apostasy in Second Thessalonians. He's the one who speaks strange things against the Most High. And of course, that's in Daniel 9, 10, and 11. Okay. He shall do a venture to do unlawful deeds on the earth against believers. Now, I want to point out something to you here. This is interesting. I've had people say, well, see, he believes that the Antichrist is going to persecute Christian believers. So obviously he believes in a post-trib rapture. Okay, that sounds logical, and he might be, except there's other places that talk about a pre-trib rapture. So what could he possibly be saying here? Well, first off, if there's no if there's a post-trib rapture, all the Christians are here, we would definitely be persecuted. Okay. 
if there's a pre-trib rapture and all the Christians are raptured, what's going to happen, according to the book of Enoch, is that the, the rapture, the purpose for the rapture is to engender repentance. You're going to get a lot of people that all of a sudden realize what's going on and accept the Lord. In uh, the book of Revelation, they're called the, uh, the um, great multitude, large group of people. And a lot of them are martyred. But that's not the point. They're martyred because they don't follow the Antichrist because they are believers. Are they Christians? Are they part of the church? No, they never did get saved while the church was still here. But there were believers before the church, believers in the church, and believers after the church. So this is a great example of, okay, the believers in the Messiah, Jewish, Gentile, church, who knows what we're talking about, but there's believers but they get persecuted by the Antichrist. So some people will assume that he's post-trib. Well, you don't know. It could be post -trib. He didn't say anything about a trib. Didn't say anything about a rapture. He just said that the Antichrist will persecute people who believe in Messiah. That's all he said. So we got to be real careful not to read into things like that. So... That's a great example here. And then next week, we'll start with Irenaeus and go through the same stuff, the premillennialism, the pre-trib quotes, and just kind of go forward. So, so far, we've seen, and all we've seen, is that the first century Christians, let's see if we can get back to here, um, several people, first century up to the third century, all taught in a 6,000-year plan of human history and a future millennial reign. Um, several of them, we looked at Papias, uh, Justin Martyr, and was that Irenaeus? Anyway, uh, several of the quotes, so several of the guys. Uh, and the idea was there's going to be a future tri a tribulation period. The only reason that it's seven years is because it's stopped by the second coming. The second coming is what starts the millennial reign. So we're all pre-millennial, and pre-tribulational. Nothing about a rapture yet, uh, but a literal antichrist, a real person that's an antichrist. John talks about anybody that's anti-Jesus is anti-Christ, but sometime in the future there's going to be an antichrist, a specific one. And that's basically all we've talked about so far. And you've learned nothing new because that's what we've always been taught. But you have learned that the early church, the ones that were taught by the apostles, by John and these guys, their interpretations, and they say that the apostles taught them this directly, is that there is a future millennial reign. So we're premillennial. There's a seven-year tribulation period, and there's an antichrist. It's mentioned by Jesus, by, by uh, Daniel, and the several other places. And you can interpret it different ways, but they all interpret it the same and that's that's where that's all we've looked at so far so when we get to irenaeus next time he's going to talk about the premillennial again we've seen that pre-trib when the end time begins not the rapture necessarily but like the birth pangs uh the roman empire how it's supposed to split and, and do different things the ten nations the abomination of desolation the antichrist the number 666 and then a kind of a summary of his teachings. So we'll do that next week. And then if we have time the following, we'll go through some of these others. And we'll notice a lot of the same teachings, but there will be specific teachings of things you probably never heard of uh, that fit in with that. But we'll see exactly what happens. So we'll stop there for tonight.